Caster Jane Show, Talk Radio for Fine Minds, airs Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern, and is always available for your listening pleasure at HallieCasterJane.com. Thank you so much for being here. I am Hallie Caster Jane. This evening on the Hallie Caster Jane Show, joining me at my table as talk show host, author, liberal political commentator, entrepreneur, advocate, and philanthropist, Tavis Smiley, here to talk about his new book, Death of a King, the real story of Dr. Martin Luther King's final year, his advocacy, his stint on America's favorite reality show, Dancing with the Stars, and so much more. But before we begin, a brief message from our sponsors. You are listening to The Hallie Caster Jane Show, talk radio for fine minds. The Hallie Caster Jane Show is always available online at HallieCasterJane.com and a host of venues, including Blog Talk Radio. But be sure to visit us at our newest home on iHeartRadio. This evening, The Hallie Caster Jane Show is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. If you want to listen to it, Audible has it. With over 150,000 titles in virtually every genre, you'll find what you're looking for. Get a free audiobook and 30-day trial this evening by signing up at www.audibletrial.com slash The Hallie Caster Jane Show. Hi, this is Hallie Caster Jane, host of The Hallie Caster Jane Show, talk radio for fine minds. Join me November 16th through 23rd at the nation's largest book fair, the 31st Miami Book Fair International in warm and sunny Miami at Miami-Dade College. Mingle with 400-plus authors from around the world, including Patricia Cornwell, Dave Barry, John Dean, Philip Margolin, Anne Rice, Elizabeth Nunez, and Joanna Rakoff. Listen to the authors read their own words, answer your questions, and autograph your books. For more information, visit MiamiBookFair.com and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. See you there. Hello, I'm Hallie Kesser Jane, host of the Hallie Kesser Jane Show. Join me Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern when I talk with the great artists, writers, musicians, politicians, and celebrities of our day. The Hallie Kesser Jane Show is talk radio for fine minds. Tune in live or listen to the podcast at HallieKesserJane.com. Tavis Smiley is the host of the late-night television talk show Tavis Smiley on PBS, as well as the Tavis Smiley Show from Public Radio International. He has authored or co-authored 16 books, including What I Know for Sure, My Story of Growing Up in America, and The Rich and the Rest of Us, A Poverty Manifesto, both of which were New York Times bestsellers. Smiley is the founder of the nonprofit Tavis Smiley Foundation, which recently announced a $3 million four year campaign called Ending Poverty America's Silent Spaces. In 2009, Time Magazine named Smiley to its list of the world's 100 most influential people. In April 2014, the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce honored him with a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. In his new book, Death of a King, the real story of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s final year, Smiley paints a powerful portrait of a leader and a visionary, casting an exceptional glimpse into King's life, adding a new, nuanced view of Dr. King's legacy as an American hero. So, Tavis, 50. Ah, that milestone. I do believe <laughs> you're a changed man, dancing with the stars, your new hairdo. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it. Um, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun, actually. I, I had never done that before, and um, it was, uh, as you said, I was about to turn 50. and thought I would do something a little bit out of the box, but I had a lot of fun with it. I, well, I want to tell you something. I enjoyed you, and I wish you were still there. Are you going to come back? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, first of all, contractually, we all have to come back. <laughs> but, uh, the, the, last, the last episodes for this season are the Monday and Tuesday of Thanksgiving week. So that Monday and Tuesday um, are the uh, final two uh, uh, airings of the season. So I think I appear, the, fin- the finale show is on that Tuesday night. So the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, the Tuesday of Thanksgiving week, I'll be on that night. 
Oh, there are a lot of people watching you, I'm sure. Yeah, well, you know, they want people want to people what? want to see who who's going to win this whole thing, and they make that announcement <laughs> that week. Who's going to win? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I think I mean, the, the betting early on was Alfonso Ribeiro from um, the Fresh Prince, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Because I mean, Alfonso is a great dancer, but a lot of these folks have done a really good job. So I don't, I don't know. As a matter of fact, I don't even know who got eliminated this week. I haven't been able to follow it. Uh, yeah, but yeah, Alfonso, we, unless he got eliminated this week, which I'm not aware of, I think people he, still think he's going to do okay. No, he didn't. Listen, you've had an extraordinary life. Some poor kid with a seemingly little opportunity at this, as a two up to this great celebrated talk show host, an entrepreneur. You're an advocate. You're a philanthropist. Now a respected writer too. A kid with your start might have not had the gumption that you had. What what motivated to have a smiley? Uh, I love people. I love people. I'm from a big family, as you intimated, and nine brothers and sisters, my mom, my dad, and my grandmother, big mama, who lived with us. So 13 of us in a three-bedroom, one-bathroom trailer. That's how I was raised. Very tight quarters, but a lot of love. Um, so I love people, and I, I, I hate people. I hate seeing people, rather, live beneath their privilege I hate seeing people live beneath their privilege. And so for me, since I was 12, I've been a student of Dr. King. And it seems to me that that our lives are best lived when we are living lives in love and service to other people. Dr. King said all the time that life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And so, again, I believe that life is best lived when it's lived with some sense of love and service to other people. And uh, I've been interested in doing that since I was a kid. I love it. This is the new book of yours, Death of a King, the real story of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s final years. Do you think um, that in a critical way, King has been misunderstood? No doubt about it. He's been misunderstood. And as I said in the book, his martyrdom in many ways has undermined his message. We get so focused on Dr. King and the I Have a Dream speech and then, of course, you know, the assassination. I think many of us think that they happen like back to back. Like one day he gave the I Have a Dream speech and they killed him the next day. Well, it didn't quite work that way. The I Have a Dream speech is in 1963. He's assassinated, you know, much too young at the age of 39. But he does live until 1968, five years after the March on Washington. And so it's fascinating to see how he changed, how he evolved who he had become over the last five years of his life, and particularly, and I think most cru- crucially, the last year of his life, when he's catching the most hell and the most hate, and when people have come against him and, and opposed him because he's uh, vehement in his opposition to the Vietnam War, the last year of his life is a story about Dr. King that we don't know and how he gets up every day and, and it remains committed to speaking the inconvenient, uncomfortable, unsettling truths that he spoke, even though it meant that everybody... Literally, everybody practically turned against him. I would love to spend some serious time in your mind. Are you listening to me? I love your head. <laughs> I do. I do. I, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan. I certainly watch a show as much as I can to learn from the big guy. You're the one, you know, mm. watch you, read you, do all of this. But listen to what I'm going to say. You were a thinking guy. So when mm. Dr. King entered your world way back when he did, that mind of yours, and this is, this is what I got from the book, it didn't simply latch on to his message. It absorbed it, and it turned it into kind of a source of motivation. And I, I wonder if that isn't the essence of Tavis Smiley. Is that what you wish more young black American kids could do for themselves? I'd love that. Um, I, I think that there uh, – let, let me put it this way, um, Hallie. I think there is a distinct difference between optimism and hope. And I've never been an optimist. I've always been, to the contrary, though, a prisoner of hope. Optimism suggests that there is a particular uh, set of facts or circumstances, conditions. Optimism says there's something you can see, feel, or touch that gives you reason to believe that things are going to get better. That's not been my experience, and quite frankly, it's not been the experience historically of black people in this country. We've never had reason to believe that things were going to get better for us. Um, so optimism has not been the street that we've lived on. Hope, on the other hand, is a very different thing. You can be hopeful even when there's no evidence to suggest that you could be. I am Exhibit A. I am Exhibit A that you can build an entire life on hope. But I also believe, having said that, that hope needs help. And when people find themselves in a situation where they are not being offered any help, the hopelessness um, grows um, and it's hard to fight against hopelessness. I saw a poll the other day that found that, for the first time ever, a slight majority of Americans think that our best days as a nation, Hallie, are already behind us. Now, it's hard to advance a democracy when that kind of hopelessness is run amok. It's hard to advance a democracy when 
poverty is threatening that very democracy, when poverty has become a matter of national security, it's hard to, to see how you know, we advance a democracy when what we're really becoming is a plutocracy, maybe even an oligarchy, but we're not the democracy that we say that we are. And so much of that has to do with people losing hope, losing faith. And if that's happening in the country writ large, then to your brilliant question, it certainly happens too often with young people, and particularly young people of color. They just don't see a way out. And in many ways, there are too many fellow citizens who are trying to navigate lives where, how might I put this, trying to navigate lives where their vulnerabilities outnumber their possibilities. And that's a hard way to live when your vulnerabilities when you wake up every day, seem to always outnumber your possibilities. That's a recipe for hopelessness, and that's hard. That's hard to navigate through. And that's why I love you. I love the way you talk. Listen to me. Do white people get it? Can 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 white people ever truly understand the life of the average Black American today? That's I mean, a great. That, that's a great question. As you know, my friend Paul, my uh, my friend um, um, uh, Nicholas Kristoff in the New York Times has been written a few powerful pieces, and I just talked to Nick the other day. Um, um, and uh, the pieces he's written about, you know, white people not getting it in the New York Times, no less, has gotten him so much hate mail. He was just sharing with me some of the responses he's received to these three columns he's written that everybody in America has been talking about. Because, again, when you're Nick Kristoff and you're writing it in the pages of the New York Times, it kicks up a serious conversation across the country, certainly on the social, in social media. And he, again, was just sharing with me, Hallie, some of the pushback he's gotten for just basically saying that we white folk just don't get it. See, I, I believe that every one of us has the capacity to love. We all have the capacity to understand, to embrace. This is not a skill problem. It's a will problem. We have the capacity to do that, but do we have the will to do that? Are we interested in doing that? So that, you know, I, I've just come to a conclusion in my own life. Let me ask you a question even more honestly. In my own life, I, I just expect that when someone is writing a review of my book or, uh, or writing a review of my work, I had a, 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 I had a, I recall very distinctly having a reporter from the New Yorker magazine. I, mean, I was so thrilled, and my team was so excited that the New Yorker had called and wanted to do a major, you know, front page, front front, uh, front cover profile of me in the New Yorker magazine. I mean, that's high cotton to be profiled as a black man in the New Yorker. And this reporter came and spent weeks, and seemed like weeks, following me around. And when the story finally came out. I read it, and it wasn't a bad story, but at the end of the day, he just didn't get it. <laughs> and what I mean by not getting it is that there are too many people that just don't understand how to revel in the humanity of black people. And he just didn't get it. And, and I might add, this was a black writer um, <laughs> who, grew up, who grew up on a different side of the tracks, apparently, but he just didn't fundamentally get what my work and witness are all about when it comes to reveling in the humanity and not contesting the humanity of everyday people. So I think people, I don't ever want to give up hope on people. I think we all have the capacity to understand and to get it and to embrace it and to revel in it. But whether or not we have the will to do that is a whole other question. You got to want it. So listen yep. to me. Does Barack Obama get it? Do you think he's done enough for the African-American child from, say, uh, Ferguson, Missouri, buddy? In a word, no. Um, has not done enough. Uh, I understand very, uh, very clearly the the obstructionism he's been up against. He's had a headwind all the way through, never really a tailwind pushing him across, but always a headwind obstructing him. I, I get that. And yet I believe that you have to live your life and govern by a certain set of immutable principles. Promising one thing on the campaign trail and governing is something different. Campaigning, governing, two very different things. Uh, and so I, I wish he'd been much more aggressive on a number of things, on the issue of poverty, on the environment, on jobs with a living wage. I could do this all day long, things I wish he had been more aggressive on, more progressive on. And now, because he's concerned about his legacy, he wants to reach across the aisle and, and work with Republicans. I'm all for, I'm all for, part of, for, for bipartisanship. I'm all for working together so long as the things that you are agreeing to are not taking the country in the wrong direction just for the sake of you saving your legacy. Um, uh, your legacy is in part determined by what you do, but it's also in part determined by what you don't do. And I believe there's a line in the sand that he needs to draw about certain things that he will not compromise on. I think his legacy will be better served in that regard. But to answer your question initially, he, he, he has not done enough. And sadly, as I keep you know reflecting upon, when he's out of office, the data, not because Tab has said it, the data is going to indicate that black people lost ground in every single leading economic category during his tenure, 
And when he's out of office, we've got to come to terms with what that data means and have a serious come to Jesus meeting. Mm. You were on Bill O'Reilly recently. Mm-hmm. That was one hell of a conversation, my buddy. Black <laughs> air, the white power structure. What? Yeah, what I know, Bill. Bill and yeah, you, so, you I get think? asked all the time, Allie, whether or not I believe. So, Tavis, do you believe that Bill O'Reilly really believes everything <laughs> that he says? And uh, and people just find it somewhat incredulous that a man of his intellect and uh, and uh, uh, learnedness. Um, could really believe that there is no such thing as white privilege in this country. It's just about working hard and pulling yourself up by your boots. I mean, the data in every in, in every you know economic, you know, uh, social, um, cultural, political category, the data the data indicates very clearly that uh, white privilege exists in this country. And, and so, you know, I I wanted to push back on that when he raised it, but as I've said many times, it's almost a good waste. Uh, it's a waste of good TV time. <laughs> to talk about and debate somebody who believes something that that crazy. But inside, are you ready to kill? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. No, I think, I mean, I think that, I mean, part part of what, part of what I believe is that Bill O'Reilly, you know, I like Bill as a person, but he's he's wrong on many things. But part of what I believe, Hallie, is that Bill O'Reilly is a real life version of the character that Steve Colbert plays on Comedy (laughs) Central. My point is that you can't take it too seriously. Now, I, I'm not naive. I understand you have to take it seriously because he has a huge following. He's preaching to the choir, and they get off on this kind of stuff. You know, same thing with Rush Limbaugh. I get all of that. So, Sean Hattie, I get all of that. But the only way you keep from blowing your brains out, the only way you keep from going insane, is to understand that, you know, in my mind, even when I'm sitting across from Bill, I'm looking at Bill and not taking him that seriously. I'm looking at him almost like the Colbert character. And in that regard, I engage the conversation. I want to get some truth out. I want to take, you know, take the opportunity seriously, but not take him too seriously. Smart, smart, smart. It's the only way you can get through it, probably. Yeah, Listen, absolutely. You're at, right? Dr. King was assassinated March 4th, 1968. I, I can't believe it's that long ago. 46 years. My God, where did the time April go? Four, April 4th, April 4th, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. All right. So he's been honored. He's revered. You don't like the fact that he's a martyr, and I get your point, and it's a point well taken. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering this, how much you think things have really changed for the average African American in this country over this time, and, and what do you think he would say? Would he be happy with where we are? Yeah, well, we certainly made progress. I said the other day to a friend of mine or in a conversation with some friends that, that the people keep asking the wrong question. The question is not whether or not black folk have made progress today from where we were 100 or 200 years ago. That's not the question. The question is how are black people doing today versus white people today, not how we were doing today versus 200 years ago. And the second question of how we're doing versus white folk today, the latter question gives you a very different answer than the other question. Of course, we've made progress from there to here. But in the here and now, as compared to white Americans, how are we doing? The data indicates, again, that in many respects, black people are still three-fifths of a person, economically speaking. We are still three-fifths of a person, earning that much of what white Americans tend to make. So that there's still work to be done. So the second part of your question is, um, what would King be saying? And I think if King were here, it's very clear to me, Hallie, he'd be continuing to say the same thing he was saying almost 50 years ago. He called America on this triple threat. He said there's a triple threat facing our country that's going to ultimately destroy our democracy if we don't take it seriously. He said that America may go to hell. These are his words. America may go to hell if we don't take seriously, Hallie, this triple threat facing our democracy. And what was that triple threat? Racism, poverty, and militarism. Racism, poverty, and militarism. You mentioned Ferguson, Missouri. Earlier in this conversation, uh, what do we see in Ferguson? racism, poverty, and militarism. So if he were here, he'd be preaching that same refrain that we've got to get serious about that triple threat facing our democracy. Tavis, the African-American community, its current leaders, and I think you're one of them, um, if there could be one change that you would want to see done right now, one suggestion that, w- that would it best be a sea change, lead to a sea change, what from the inside the community itself can be done to foment change? I think I think everything begins and ends, Hallie, honestly, with jobs, jobs, jobs with a living wage. Sadly, poor people cannot, you know, in mass employ themselves. They can raise this issue in mass, but they cannot in mass employ themselves. 
Um, but that's fundamentally what we're lacking in this country is the respect and the dignity that comes from everybody having a chance to work, to use their God-given skill and talent to make some kind of contribution to the nation and make a living for themselves and their family and their loved ones. That's what we're lacking, a fundamental commitment to every fellow citizen having a job, not with a minimum wage, with a living wage. We could ever get that right because so much, so many of the tentacles um, um, that we see uh, off of poverty are, are the issues that we wrestle with today. There's so many tentacles that come off of being impoverished. You can't get a good education. You can't get a good house. You can't have a savings account. You can't do this. You can't do that because you don't have the means to do it. So if we could ever figure out this crisis, and I believe that in this country, again, we can, we, we can have a job, a meaningful job for every American who wants one if that were our priority. That's what we're lacking, that kind of commitment. So, Tavis... Just yes. one more question. Okay. Mm-hmm. What's Tom Bergeron really like? What's who? <laughs> Tom Bergeron really like. <laughs> That's funny. Tom's a nice guy. He's, uh, he can be a little snarky at times and a little, a little uh, he, he's funny. But he's actually a very nice guy. I like, I like Tom and uh, Aaron Andrews was nice. I mean, I had a good time. I tell you this, the, the fun of doing the show was where the, where the people you work with, there's a wonderful team of people there that you work with. I mean, a massive, that's a big show. My PBS show, you know, my, my staff is much smaller than something like that. It's a big operation. There are a lot of people that are there, but um, there's a lot, a lot of fun, a lot of love, a lot of camaraderie. I mean, the best part is hanging out with the other dancers and these professional dancers. My God, I would just sit in rehearsal sometimes and just watch them because they're so good at what they do. Um, so it's, I had a lot of fun. Tom's, Tom, Tom's a great guy. He, uh, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. Well, you're a great guy. I want to you're, thank you for You're kind to say that. I, no, Hallie, thank truth. you for having me on. I so enjoyed this. Thank you. I've been speaking with Tavis Smiley, host of the late night television talk show, Tavis Smiley, on PBS, as well as the Tavis Smiley Show from Public Radio International. His new book, Death of a King, the real story of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s final year by way of Little Brown. For more information on Mr. Smiley and his work, visit TavisTalks.com. Before I go, I want to remind everyone that podcasts of current and past shows are always available to listen to free on iTunes under The Hallie Kasser Jane Show. The Hallie Kasser Jane Show was also available for download via Spreaker.com, Stitcher.com, BlogTalkRadio.com, and a host of other venues. Google The Hallie Kasser Jane Show and you will find us. Of course, podcasts of our shows, both past and present, are always posted for your listening pleasure at HallieKasserJane.com which I hope you'll visit often for the latest information on our upcoming segments. Oh, and while you're at HallieCasserJane.com, don't forget to visit my blog to read my latest musings. I'll be back next week, same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, for another edition of the Hallie Casser Jane Show, Talk Radio for Fine Minds, brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at www.audibletrial.com forward slash the Hallie Casser Jane Show. Audible.com features over 100,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Stay in touch, won't you? Remember, that's HallieCasserJane.com. Discover us on Facebook at Hallie Kesser Jane and on Twitter at Hallie CJ. I love to hear from you. So, till we meet again, this is Hallie Kesser Jane. It's a wrap. <laughs>